Hi everyone, it's Amy here from the blog I Think Therefore I Teach. Welcome to your next Criminology instalment. This is for Unit 4 and it is 2.2. .2. Right, let's get going. Two point two then is discuss the aims of punishment. You need to be able to understand the role of punishment in the criminal justice system. So the first thing I got my students to think about was why do we punish criminals at all? What is the purpose? What is the point of punishing criminals? Why are there crimes to begin with? When people then commit those crimes, why do we then punish it? And so I got my students to think about as many different reasons as they could. And some students drew upon knowledge that they already had from subjects like law, so they were able to use some words and then share these with the class. I also got the students to consider the different theories of crime that we studied in Unit 2, uh, so 4.1. What sorts of punishment uh, would be supported by biochemical theories, psychodynamic theories and right realism? It is so important that you do know some of your Unit 2. So your 2.1, your 2.2 and your 2.3, your individualistic, your biological and your sociological reasons. And then 4.1 looks at what sorts of therapies and treatments these then impose onto people like talk and economy etc this topic then you need to be able to discuss the aims of punishment which are retribution rehabilitation deterrence public protection and reparation these are the five that you need to know so people don't always agree on the purpose of sentencing criminals. The Criminal Justice Act of 2003 in Section 42 says that the aims of sentencing are punishment of wrongdoers, reduction of crime through deterrence, so you are deterred to do crime because of how you see someone else being treated, reforming those that have committed offences, so when they have committed offence, reforming them and helping them so they don't do another crime, protecting the public, you need to take them away, get them out of the general public so that they are protected and finally making reparation by offenders to those people affected by their crimes. Um, so it's the idea that they need to repair, reparation, repair, repair the damage that they have done. It is so important, the bit in yellow there, it's, that is just, that has marks written all over it. Remembering things like that is brilliant. Where these certain things are found gets you a lot of good points. And so I just got them to quickly rank order one to five, one being the top reason, fifth being uh, the least as for the purpose that students believe um, for sentencing criminals. And we had a bit of a discussion. Retribution then. Retribution is basically payback. The punishment is seen as a display of public revulsion for the offence. The punishment is a way for society and victims to get some kind of justice or compensation for what the offender did to them. It's linked to the concept eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And so the severity of the crime determines the harshness of the sentence. This is known as proportionality. The crime should be in proportion to the punishment. Retribution sees it as only fair that the offender should be made to suffer for their wrongdoing. Prison, hard labour and death penalty, which is the ultimate retribution, are examples. It is literally a backward looking approach. You've done something wrong, you're going to get punished for it. It's not forward looking, we're not looking at how to help them, how to stop it in the future. No, you've done something wrong, you are going to be punished. There is no attempt to alter future behaviour, to change or to rehabilitate. It is purely um, to punish them for what they have done in proportion to the crime committed. Deterrence may be a side effect as in, I don't want to have the death penalty so I'm not going to do what they did. It might deter you from a crime but that's only a side effect. That is not the aim of retribution. Historically then, the death penalty was used for lots of crimes. Applying proportionality meant that different forms of putting people to death had to be thought of to reflect the seriousness of the crime. So what this means is, is that back in the olden days, death penalty was given out a lot, whereas today that is the ultimate retribution you could have if you are given the death penalty obviously it's illegal in most countries now but for example if you're in texas and you'll get the death penalty that's the ultimate retribution however in the olden days death penalty was quite common so you could steal something and have the death penalty so then they had to work out the proportionality in that if you then do something really bad 
The death penalties had to then get worse, as in the ways you died had to become worse. So, for example, a traitor was hung, drawn and quartered. Horrendous way to die. Servants who killed their masters were boiled alive. People were burned at the stake for witchcraft. So these are all still death penalty. These are all still retribution, but they are extreme in what they are doing so it's not just death it was actually in proportion to the crimes that they thought were committed however today the sentencing council in the uk helps with proportionality by giving guidelines to courts on the appropriate sentences so in the coroners and justice act of 2009 says these guidelines should be followed in the interest of justice retributive retro i can never say this word retribute ret retro yeah, retributive justice. There you go. I, it's, I'm not very good with that one. Can be seen in the mandatory life sentence for murder. Crimes motivated by hate are given an uplift, so harsher cry, uh, harsher punishments, to show part of retribution is to represent moral outrage. So, for example, GBH usually is given a five-year prison sentence, but if it's driven by racism, then it can be raised to seven years. So it's the idea that these can be uplifted. So it's not just GBH, it's GBH plus something like racism, which means that the retribution stands get higher because of the moral outrage. The punishment is seen as necessary and morally correct in itself to right the wrong. So I got my students to write down five countries that still have the death penalty and the crimes that you have to commit to get the death penalty. Um, what are the crime rates like in these countries? Is there a parallel between lower crimes because there's the death penalty or is there no parallel at all? Does death penalty as retribution work? Does it work? Is there... Is, is there a lack of crime or is there just lots of people awaiting the death penalty? And do you think our retribution in the UK works? Do you think our punishments that are given are good enough? Do you think that the proportionality between what people do and the punishments they are given are enough? Which theories that might support retribution as a name of sentences? Right, realism. Right realism is linked to rational choice theory and sees people as rational actors who consciously choose to commit crime. If you are consciously, deliberately, with free will doing an action, then you need to be consciously, deliberately and with free will punished for it. They are therefore fully responsible and therefore it's fitting that they are punished to suffer the outrage of society for their choices. Functionalism, Durkheim would say that retribution allows the expression of moral outrage, so it provides a function. It allows a release of the anger and hurt suffered. This helps to reinforce social norms and expectations of the group and punish deviants. Number two then, rehabilitation or reformation. This view of sentencing criminals contrasts with retribution as it's forward-looking. The point of this is to help the person change their behaviour for the future and join back into society. It takes the view that the person is free-thinking individual, capable of change and learning. And so forms of sentence might be supported include alcohol and drug abuse programmes, anger management, community sentences or community service, education and training to help them um, reconsider their behaviour and rationally choose alternatives other than crime. These things might also be seen as good because they help the person to find meaningful work in society which could in turn help them to remain law abiding. It requires a lot of joined up working though from different agencies in the CGS criminal justice system, both inside and outside prison. So, for example, probation helps the person access the right training, education and therapy. But you not only need the probation person, you then need the training, the education, therapy, all of these things. All of these people need to be set up, organised, um, you know, the, the, the working of these people that has to be joined together, all for the person that has committed the crime. It also requires that the person themselves are willing to cooperate and learn. At the end of the day, like it says higher, that the individual is capable of change and learning, yes, but only if they want to. And so I got my students to think about, is this realistic or idealistic? As in, is this realistic? Do people change? Do people want to change? Do you think that these trainings, this education and community servicing will help 
or is it just an ideal is it does it sound good on paper but in practice it just doesn't work so again what are your thoughts on this which theories might support rehabilitation? You've got Eisenach's personality theory. This would support the use of behaviour modification techniques such as aversion therapy. And again, I've got my students to then look up Eisenach and the aversion therapy ideas. Skinner's operant conditioning would support the idea that the behaviour can be modified, certainly with rewards and punishments, so like token economy. Cognitive behavioural therapy can also change the faulty thinking processes. And I got them to research again into token economy and uh, CBT. Finally, left realism would support the idea of helping people into work, etc., because crime has happened due to social inequalities, poverty, poor educational opportunities. And so by breaking these barriers, you can get people back on the straight and narrow. And um, I then got my students to read an article on the prison strategy white paper of 2020. If you Google it, you'll find it no problem. And just to basically uh, complete a worksheet that I created them linking um, the prison strategy into how it shows rehabilitation. An exam question then from 2018 paper discuss retribution and rehabilitation as aims of sentence 10 marks. I got my students to think about how would they approach this question, what would they include and so you need an explanation to each term, examples of how they try and meet the aims, key specialist terminology, links to criminological theories and case studies and so I got them to write down and plan an answer for this. Finally, does it work or not work as an aim of sentencing? So you could do a bit of a comparison about which one works better or for different crimes which ones which the re, re retribution works better for which one does rehabilitation work better for this then was a sample answer um, out uh, this one got eight marks in total and the mark scheme is there to to help them and i got them just to basically read through it and to highlight what was good to pick out what was good about this answer um, and then how they could have got the last two marks what are they missing um, so i won't read it to you but obviously you can pause it at this point and uh, read through for yourself what would you add to this answer to make it the full 10 marks Deterrence. The idea that the purpose of punishment is to put other people off committing offences because the consequences are unpleasant. I don't want that to happen to me, so I'm not going to do that crime. Aims are to reduce offending in the first place. So, for example, prison as a consequence may deter people and modify their behaviour. Deterrence can be individual, administered to the particular individual to put them off offending again. So, for example, use of suspended sentences only comes into effect if the person re-offends though so under thatcher's government of the 1980s the short sharp shock approach was used as a policy to in juvenile detention centers a short harsh experience to put people off re-offending so they were put in short experience but it was a horrible experience for them and therefore put them off in the future this happened to only the individual and um, suspended sentencing means that you get um uh, kind of a warning that if you commit certain crimes when you're on the suspended sentence or license you will then not only be put in you will not only be punished for your original crime you'll be punished for the crime you then do when you're on um, suspended sentence general in this sense people in the community witness someone being punished and this deters them from committing crime to avoid punishment themselves in the past people were publicly punished e.g in the stocks when you had you know, rotten cabbages, they're dirty cabbages, rotten cabbages thrown at you, executions, public executions, floggings, so being whipped. Um, today, people might be deterred by reading about things in the media. And I got my students then to read the article of the judge who orders thieves to wear uh, confession signs. So, um, uh, ordered thief, sorry, this is in America. And again, you can easily find it on Google. But it's a, an American one where a man had to stand on the street with a sign that basically said exactly what he'd done um, for, for a certain length of time. and was basically just a public humiliation um, because the, the, that's the, the line the judge took. And so it would deter everybody else from thinking, gosh, I don't want to do that because I don't want to stand there with a the sign. It also might put the individual off thinking I don't want to do this ever again deterrence continued then you have severity versus certainty how severe a punishment may be if there is very little chance of being caught and convicted then it's unlikely to deter people from re-offending from uh, sorry from offending in the first place so if 
you have very little chance of getting caught doesn't really matter how severe the punishment is it's not going to deter you so for example um a lot of people smoke weed weed obviously is illegal but many many people smoke weed but there's no there's very little chance of getting caught and if they are caught they'll get a slap on the wrist very little chance of being convicted so therefore they can say you can have as harsh a punishment as you want to people are very it's very unlikely to deter people from offending and doing it so, for example, there is a mandatory minimum sentence of three years for your third burglary, but only 5% of reported burglaries result in a successful conviction. So what that basically means is only 5% of burglaries actually have their first successful conviction. So a third one for only three years, that's not going to put anybody off. They would rather gamble and risk it, thinking, well, chances of me getting convicted in the first place is very unlikely. Chance of me getting convicted three times is even less unlikely. So... And then if I am convicted of doing a third burglary, I only get three years anyway. So that is not a severe punishment. That is not a deterrence. People just would risk it. On the other hand, if an offender is very likely to be caught, even a mild punishment may be an effective deterrent. So, for example, um, the example I gave my students was speeding tickets. You are very likely to get caught with a speeding ticket. You get um a fine and you have to go on a, a course that's a fairly mild punishment but it still puts people off i don't want to be fined in fairness actually the fine doesn't really bother me the fine doesn't deter me it's the having to give up my time to go on a speed awareness course that's what would deter me um and because i you're very very likely to get caught people will remain at the relevant speed and the right speed for that area which theories then might support deterrence as an aim? Right realism, rational choice theory regards people as actors who assess the costs and benefits. They weigh things up um, before deciding to break the law or not. Severe punishments could therefore deter the offender. Operant conditioning, if you have a harsh punishment, again, it's going to deter the individual because you don't want to be punished and you don't like punishment. Social learning theory, punishments can act as a general deterrent, vicarious punishment, um, well that's more uh, Bandura, sorry as well, so the idea that you see other people being punished, it's a general deterrent for you. And I got them to add some more detail and keywords to the answers above, so right realism, operant conditioning and social learning theory, so they get better marks in their exam. Public protection. This is known other um, sorry, this is otherwise known as incapacitation, making it physically impossible for criminals to offend again. You will incapacitate them. All in the interest of protecting society. So the extreme versions of public protection are execution. If you execute somebody, they aren't doing another crime against the public again. Banishment. If they're not in the country, they can't then hurt you. So hence why in the 19th century many convicts were sent to Australia. Physically cutting off hands of thieves. You can't steal things if you haven't got any hands to steal things with. Uh, this was done in England in the past. Saudi Arabia, for example, still use it today. Chemical castration of sex offenders. This is in some states in America today. Um, so chemical castration um, is questionable, though, because um, a lot of people still, the urges are still there. So the need to still want to commit these sex crimes on other people is still prominent. So that one is very, very questionable as to actually does it work or not. Less extreme curfews, getting them off the streets for certain times so that if they're not out on a night, for example, where people may be more vulnerable. Electronic tags, you know exactly where they are at all times. Driving bans, you can't get behind the wheel of a car if you have committed driving offences, again, protects the people in the public. Travel bans, so for example, this often happens to football hooligans, they're not allowed to travel or go to certain to watch certain matches, so you are stopped from travelling, again, to protect the public. Prison then has public protection. This is the most common form of incapacitation. Offenders removed from society. The Crimes and Sentences Act of 1997 introduced standard sentences for specific offences. So, for example, a minimum of seven years if a person has a third conviction for a Class A drug trafficking charge. The CGA in 2003 says prison is partly meant for public protection and it introduced indeterminate sentences where there is no set release date. This is for people deemed so dangerous to society for particularly violent or sexual offences that there is no end date 
because they don't know when they will be rehabilitated or ever released. In the USA, Jerry Williams was given a 25 year to life without parole because he stole a slice of pizza. It was his third offence and this was part of the three strikes on York outlaw in the 1990s. His sentence was reduced to six on appeal. But basically, when you follow strict rules and there is no budging from these rules, like the three strikes and you're out rule, then it becomes very, very hard to look at the specific individual cases. So for something like Jerry Williams, that's in a very extreme case for his third offence, but it's his third stealing offence, therefore 25 years without parole, even though the stealing was a slice of pizza. So an optic link she could make then the biological theories. If it can be shown that criminals are born that way, then it's not possible to rehabilitate or change them. And therefore, they just need to be put away to help protect society. Lombroso argued for sending criminals far away to remote islands to keep them away from the public. Biological theories might support chemical castration as public protection from sex offenders. And right realism, a small number of persistent offenders are responsible for the majority of crime. So it's acceptable to incapacitate the small few um, for longer sentences to save the majority. Finally, reparation. This approach to punishment is to allow the person to make amends. It can be tailored to the particular crime committed. So, for example, property crime, the person could be told to compensate the victim for the damage with a compensation order. Or if someone has damaged public property, the person could be sentenced to community payback as part of the community order, which might involve them clearing rubbish from parks, road verges, clearing off graffiti. So, again, community payback is compensation to make amends. Restorative, oops, don't know what happened there. Restorative justice is a type of reparation. It can involve the offender and victim meeting together with a facilitator. So restorative justice, this is where they meet with the person that they've committed the crime against. The victim can tell the offender the effect their crime has had on them and the offender listens and has the chance to say sorry and to realise the full extent of their crime. So... This can be very, very powerful. For example, if you do a robbery, burglary of an old person or you rob an old person, you, you this can work very well actually then meeting the old person and how it has affected their life or meeting the family of that person and how much it's affected them. But again, this all depends on whether the, the person that committed the crime is willing to see the effects, to understand, to want and listen. Otherwise, it can be extremely traumatic for the victim or the victim's family. It can also be done in writing if they can or don't want to meet in person. The offender can express their remorse and seek forgiveness. And I got my students then to read an article on the Norway prisons. Um, and again, if you Google Norway prisons, Norway prisons are fascinating. They are completely different to what we have in this country and how they try and do reparation and rehabilitation. And basically, they're like Disneyland. They say that if you treat people like animals, they behave like animals. If you treat them like human beings, they will want to integrate once more back into society as human beings once more. So very, very interesting is the Norway prisons. Theories that might support reparation, left realism, it aids mutual understanding and can be a practical step towards a more caring and equal society. Labelling theory, it can reintegrate people back into mainstream society rather than just labelling them as criminal. It allows them to express their remorse and helps prevent the slide into secondary deviance and then full um, label status. Functionalism. Durkheim favoured this kind of approach to be able to put things back into a harmonious state for the smooth running of society. Finally, an exam style question scenario. Joe was charged with assault after getting into a fight. Even though it was his first offence, the trial judge gave him a lengthy custodial sentence. She said that this was to protect the public and to teach him a lesson for the future. Discuss the aims of the sentence that Joe received, nine marks. And so what would you include? Which aims of punishment is the question inviting you to discuss? So you could have looked at public protection in this answer, all the different things you could mention, the, bio, the biological, the uh, synoptic links you can do, and then obviously the pros and the cons of whether this works or doesn't work. You could also talk about deterrence and how you're doing individual deterrence for Joe, but also general public deterrence. 
all right folks hopefully you've found that one useful give me a thumbs up if you if you and a like if you uh, have found it useful don't forget to put any comments or questions uh, below and i will try and respond subscribe so you don't miss out on any future postings and otherwise and um, thanks very much for watching everybody bye for now